Today we're going to talk about assurance and sustainability. That's not just in the environmental sense, though sometimes it is. If a device stops working after a few years because it doesn't get updates, then there becomes an environmental cost to tech stopping working. But fundamentally, this is about how are you sure whether something will work and for how long can you keep it working? Uh, how long do you need to keep it working for? How much will that cost? Can you do it without the costs escalating to unbearable depths? And can you do it without dumping all of those costs onto end users? So a few definitions. First, assurance, or whether a system will work and how you're sure of this, uh, that used to be about mean time between failure. How can you be sure of a mean time between failure of a million hours? Well, you test something for a million hours. Um, these days, with uh, DevSecOps, it's more about future patching commitment. How long do you need this to work for? Do you have the resources for keeping it working for that long? Compliance. How can you satisfy other people of this? That usually means regulators, but it can also mean uh, insurance markets. Sustainability. How long will it work for? And can you design the system so that it will be cheap to maintain over that time period. Assurance isn't static. Uh, getting a lab to test something five years ago clearly doesn't make it secure, uh, even though that's typically the common criteria approach. It may work as a liability shield and it may be okay from a safety perspective, but as safety and security get intertwined, especially in cars, where you update the car every week to keep it uh, secure and that conflicts with safety, then these kinds of approaches don't really get you anything other than perhaps a liability shield. Assurance and compliance are both political and economic. Overall, this is a game to minimize overall cost, and it's easily diverted towards superficial theater where something doesn't work, but you've managed to externalize all of your costs and make all of the failure the user's problem rather than yours. And this has really changed over the past decade. Ten years ago we had laptops which uh, are kept online and patched every month and cars which we tested to death and never connected to the internet. New cars are connected to the internet so they need both. They need to be tested to death and they need to evolve as the threats change and still be safe while doing that. So secure systems need incentives, policy, mechanisms and assurance and usability cuts through all four of these uh, for developers uh, as well as users because while users will need to clearly be able to use something in the intended way to keep its secure properties, this is also true of developers who, if we aren't careful, are led down the garden path to use unsafe defaults like an electronic code book, even if they're following best practice and using all of the right libraries. So I mentioned that 10 years ago assurance was all about mean time between failure, and these days it's more about future patching commitment. This is because of the development of DevOps, where you blur development and execution. Your dev team continuously deploys new versions of products in response to real feedback. Uh, you integrate feedback and evolving feature sets into an iterative slash software as a service development cycle by blurring development and execution. And that can be extended to DevSecOps, where you integrate security in too, uh, by adapting your entire development lifecycle to handle new threats as they appear uh, through uh, your honeypots and intrusion detection systems, and also, uh, security becomes an end-to-end -end property embedded in all development, uh, with automated testing for security as well as functionality. Uh, fundamentally, DevSecOps involves what we call a shift left. Uh, what does that mean? You shift the thinking of security, not as something that is reactive and only happens in deployment at the end of development. It's there right from the start, and that makes it cheaper. Because you don't have all of that technical debt that stops you from making something secure because you made poor decisions earlier on. Another way of thinking about that shift left is that you fail fast by engaging security experts early. Uh, 
uh, you use lots of static analysis and code suggestion to get rid of bad code smells uh, right at the start before they really harm you. You do lots of continuous monitoring and automated and manual testing, penetration tests, and you run bug bounties to mean that you get an ecosystem developing around people finding faults in your product rather than having to employ them all. As with many of the modern development environments, this is about solving your hardest problems first, getting security in there early when it can't hurt you, which is fundamentally the defining principle behind both spiral and agile development models. And so you'll have probably heard of uh, the waterfall model, which was the traditional way of building very rigid, specified, uh, tightly defined products with a fixed endpoint of their development. Uh, that you, as you move down this cycle, things get more costly and more difficult to change. And that's intentional. That means you can stick to specifications and therefore get things correct. Um, this forces you to be precise very early on, but the inevitable failure of Waterfall is that you end up building the wrong thing very precisely. This is very good for certification because you know exactly what you're building, but it can be very bad for assurance because you can't react to the real failures that you experience in deployment. So the response to that is, if you're going to throw away your first waterfall model anyway, because it's going to be fundamentally the wrong thing, then you should do a series of waterfalls, right? And that's where spiral came from. In a spiral, you have multiple different prototypes until you eventually ship. And to deal with uncertainty around security, you tackle the hardest bits in earlier prototypes to reduce that uncertainty, to make it cheaper to deal with any failures because you spot them earlier on and can adapt the rest of the product. If you take that mindset to the extreme, then you get Agile, which is literally focusing on what is my hardest, less riskiest problem. This is all about assurance, right? This is about making your very focus avoiding risks around assurance uh, within two week sprints. Now, all of these things are really a continuum of ideas, and uh, some of them are more cultural than specific, but there certainly is value in reducing risk, and the entire Silicon Valley development model has optimized towards that over the past 20 years, and now it's getting brought in with security as well as all other requirements. We've talked about this concept of technical debt before, um, where DevSecOps is all about avoiding technical debt, where you have shortcuts that you take to make a quick and dirty fix that you then have to repay later, hence this idea of debt. Um, if you have this quick and dirty clutch, you will make it more expensive to fix later. Granted, it might make sense to do that for a startup or a product late in life where you don't really care about the assurance for the late in life product, you just want to keep it going for a few more months. And with the startup, it's all about winning the market. So if you have greater costs down the line, that may be outweighed by you wanting to take the market very quickly to build up a user base. But in general, you want to run your DevOps environment debt-free. You don't add in these clergy hacks. You make stuff work so that your development will be sustainable and you won't went, end up with unmaintainable code. Uh, products that do fall to technical debt uh, usually do so due to mismanagement or poor incentives. They become too hard to maintain or use, so you end up having to replace them completely, which is clearly extremely expensive and inefficient, or may even be impossible. There are many big software products that have to be evolutionary because it's impossible to rebuild them. Now, this philosophy tries to keep the developer's potential propensity for making mistakes out of the picture. Uh, you automate your configuration as well as your build so that someone can't break a build just by mistyping something. Uh, you use proxy tools where possible. You don't give your developers direct access to something that might break deployment. Uh, you give them an indirect access with highly vetted controls and logging to reduce the chance of a severe failure. But at the same time, you don't want to actually give 100% reliability as your target. Uh, 
Google's view on this is that you set a realistic reliability target in the high nines at 99.9% .9 and use the rest for failure recovery, upgrades and experiments. And we'll see a little bit more on that later, but you don't want these nasty failures to only be the exception because then you won't be able to deal with them when they happen. So how do you actually design so that you can have high assurance by designing for testability? Well, the tools that we can use uh, include uh, unit tests, right? Where you test the functionality of your program by testing each of the parts of it in isolation. Frameworks for this include JUnit in Java, Google Test in C++, and XUnit for all X, where as well as JUnit, there are equivalent tools for most other languages. Um, an example of a JUnit test is on the screen just here, where we've got a test that we can run, which times out after 100 seconds, i.e. if it runs forever, this won't just break the test rig, it will fail at that point. Um, and what this does is it tests, you know, here, it's just a trivial test, but it, it tests that the functionality of these functions that we're calling is preserved when we rerun the experiment. And you'll run this every time you try and commit something to your main repository, typically. Um, there's this concept called test-driven development, where you write the tests first, uh, rather than in a traditional waterfall, which we saw earlier, where your implementation and unit testing, uh, the unit testing comes after the implementation. In test-driven development, it comes first. You write your tests first, and that is what tells you whether your implementation is correct or not. You finished when you pass all of your tests, rather than reacting to your tests that you've written after the fact, which will bias your thinking about what the program should do based on what you've written. These days you'll spend more money and time on the test than the actual code. Uh, so you really do want to design things in a way that are cheap to test because that's the only way that you'll be efficient enough to write real applications at scale. And that means that you'll want to spend time refactoring your code to make it testable. When you've got unit tests, you won't want to run on a realistic environment. You'll want to abstract away as much as possible. Things like network interfaces where it can go wrong just because the traffic coming in is different from what you expect. You'd want to avoid in a unit test. You want to abstract it away uh, because otherwise you'll end up with flaky tests that will just fail some of the time due to random error and which people start to ignore. And when people ignore the test that you're running, that's when you get into real trouble. Examples of things that you can do with unit testing include GCC's torture test suite, where you'll test multiple versions of GCC against each other um, for the same behavior with code that's known to exhibit unusual corner cases to make sure that you don't get regression between your new version of the compiler and the old version of the compiler. There's a witch proof, which is a suite that's used to find vulnerabilities in crypto algorithms, where you throw lots of tests that are known to break lots of implementations against your implementation to make sure that you don't make the same mistakes that other people have made in the past. So if unit testing is for testing things in isolation, integration testing is for when you want to run your entire application and work out whether it's safe to deploy or whether there are any bugs in it. Examples of these frameworks include Jenkins, which is shown on screen at BuildBot and GitLab. And what you will do in a continuous integration system is run all of your unit tests before merging remotely, then run the integration tests remotely on your build server to make sure that you haven't introduced any new bugs that have been seen before in your test suite. So you have the build, you run the test, assuming that the build passed. If all of the tests pass, then you'll deploy. And that's how your deployment works. Your deployment is gated by passing all of these tests so that even if someone were to write some code that was buggy and try and deploy it, your tests sit in the way of that and stop them from doing that by mistake. And that will be fundamentally the gateway to things like deploying a nightly. You may not deploy your stable versions in this way, 
but you may deploy your nightly builds in this way that may go out to certainly beta testers. Right, so while your unit tests will use abstractions to make it easier to test them in isolation and to avoid flakiness, for your integration test that won't be good enough. For these should use the real interfaces uh, because that is what your real users will be using and so you need this to be as similar to that environment as possible. But nevertheless, you don't want your tests to introduce new security risks. You need to be careful around the privileges of your tests in any principle of least privilege. You don't use real data because that is going to be too flaky. It's going to cause tests to fail at random and it's potentially secret and you don't want your test servers to be privy to lots of secret information. You don't leave secrets in your code. You don't hard code secret keys in there. Even into the test rig, uh, you have a separately validated key management server that keeps all of your secrets in and that can be really locked down very tightly. What sort of tools do you use to actually run tests on code? What sorts of analyses should you have? Well, let's first talk about dynamic analyzers, which run over the code, potentially at uh, debug time or potentially at runtime. What we have here is address sanitizer, which is a debug time tool that you run as part of your testing framework. And you couple this with fuzzing, i.e. sending random inputs uh, to your application to try and find memory safety bugs, i.e. issues around buffer overflows and use after freeze in C or C++ manually managed languages. Um, so the way that address sanitizer works is that it tries to stop you from going outside the bounds of objects or reusing old objects that you thought you deleted. And the way it does that is it every time you do a load or a store, you look up the address of the load or store, put that into an index of this shadow space that just stores a bit for every location in memory. You poison around the edge of the object. You set these red zones and with that and with fuzzing, you can try and find random inputs that cause you to do these memory accesses that you thought were impossible and that violate the semantics of your chosen language. And you do that by instrumenting the code with these checks uh, in the compiler. Uh, you instrument every load by checking the shadow memory at about a 2x performance overhead, hence why this is used in debug rather than in production. MTE, which we saw a couple of lectures ago, is basically a hardware version of this, which is hopefully cheap enough to use at deployment time. This is not. This is something where 2x is okay at debug time. It's not okay in deployment, so you wouldn't use this all the time. And that brings us to this idea of sanitizers and mitigators, where sanitizers, including address sanitizer, are things that you run at debug time, potentially with a fuzzer to find bugs. Whereas mitigators are something that you use in deployment that are there to perhaps not find bugs, but prevent their use. Uh, mitigators need to be very, very cheap um, because they're running all of the time. Um, whereas sanitizers can be a little bit more expensive as long as it doesn't make your tests too slow or unrealistic. These both increase assurances, therefore, in different ways. Your mitigators may not find everything and they won't be allowed to have false positives. Otherwise, your real code in real deployment will break. Sanitizers, on the other hand, can have a few false positives and they will often be designed to alarm and throw errors a lot more as a result. Um, if they do throw these false positives, then you can avoid triggering that error again by adding in things like attributes to ignore things that you know are actually okay, as well as the address sanitizer that we talked about, there are things like UBSAN, which is about undefined behavior. So imagine that we've got an integer multiplication or something that constantly overflows with certain inputs that we know are so high as to be unrealistic in our real code. And yet the sanitizer tells us, yeah, it's technically possible for you to overflow and therefore get a result that's mathematically invalid. You can say, yeah, I know that's technically true, but I can ignore it. I know it's never going to happen in my real program. So you remove that from the equation by telling it to not be sanitized. I've mentioned already that the way that you use sanitizers in debug is 
typically by combining it with fuzzers. You give them random inputs and check if with those random inputs bad things will start happening that will be then detected by the sanitizer even if it won't directly cause a crash in the application, i.e. it would be a silent bug without the sanitizer there. Now, sometimes this can just be literally with random numbers. That's what dumb fuzzing is. You use a random number generator, run your functions with those random numbers and just see what happens. Um, smart fuzzing will use domain specific dictionaries to try and convert random numbers to random inputs with a specific distribution about them or in a specific context to convert those to the actual inputs that you would expect. In LLVM, there's this fuzzed data provider, which will do format conversion for a random input. Your, the way you design your fuzzed data provider is it will take in a random input and then you will convert it into something that is random but meaningful in context. Now, that random integer might become a particular string, for example. Um, libfuzzer is a tool that will create a corpus for your fuzzer based on code coverage. So even though fuzzing is just about randomness, it doesn't guarantee complete coverage, you can combine that with uh, something like libfuzzer to create a corpus of random inputs that do cover every single branch direction in the code. Uh, so you get at least coverage of the entire code, even if you don't exhaustively test every single possible input, which is probably impossible for most code. You may often combine fuzzing with chaos engineering, which we'll talk a bit more about later, where chaos engineering uh, means that you have faults all of the time and you just deal with them so that if an attacker does the same, you'll be prepared. Uh, so you might inject faults into both tests and production via fuzzing just to see what happens, just to make sure that nothing breaks. Uh, things like uh, latency and service failure will be things that your real-world application will need to deal with, and so you'll need to test for them via a chaos engineering methodology. So that's dynamic analysis, where you run tools over the code itself being actually run. Static analyzers run before you've run any actual code. These are compile time tools. Um, linters, which are the first example we're going to look at, are here and include examples like error-prone in Java and clang-tidy for C++. What these linters look for um, are things like uh, stylistic and readability errors, uh, code smells, which they may not be wrong. You may not have actually got a bug in here, but you've got a tool that will throw an alarm anyway because often when people write this stuff, it's probably wrong. The example we have on screen is one such example of something that is valid C, but a tool like a LLVM's uh, Clang Tidy will complain about. What you've done here in C is you've done a memset over a buffer of size buff length, and that's what you've written here. But what this will actually do is run size off on the macro buff length. It will expand out to size of 42 which is not what you actually intended because 42 is an integer and so this will mem set from 0 to 4 when what you actually intended to do most likely is set all of your buffer to 0 and that is 42 bytes rather than just the size of a single integer. So this is almost certainly wrong even though it's valid C and these tools should complain about that. If you weren't wrong then even though your code is technically correct, you should probably write something else because usually when code is written like this, it becomes buggy even if it's not buggy to death. And as long as you use these tools early on, having all of these complaints about code that may technically be correct is okay. It's not going to cost you very much to change the code and make it so that it's more sustainable and going to be easier to maintain over the years. And usually with these linters, you can add your own custom tools in there, um, not just for bugs, but for also matching the house style of your code. If you're writing code with many people, you'll want that house style to match. and You'll need to decide it between you and you can design extra extensions of things like Clang Tidy to automatically check for that every time you commit code. Um, other things that you can do with things like this are 
common performance optimizations, things like a modernizing code, replacing a string find with a starts with from the abseil library, which is typically faster. Um, things like replacing nulls with the term null pointer, which has better error, error characteristics, even though they're both correct. Then we move on to bug finders, which are static tools that rather than replacing code smells and doing quite surface level analysis like a linter will do, these will go into code, look at it more in more detail, perhaps at an inter-procedural level rather than over just a few lines of code within a procedure. And what they do is they don't try to prove any correctness over the code. They just go through and try and find lots and lots and lots of bugs. And Coverity, which the article on screen is referencing, is one such tool. Another one is Clang Analyzer. Another one is SonarCube. Um, these tools don't typically tend to be complete. They don't find all bugs. And they're also not sound in that they may find lots of things that aren't really bugs at all. So what you want to do when you're using these tools is start using them early. Otherwise, you'll be overwhelmed by bug reports of things that may or may not be real bugs. What's the difference between a static analyzer in this sense, i.e. Clang analyzer, and a linter, i.e. Clang tidy? Well, there's a lot of overlap, but something like Clang tidy will give you code suggestion and automatic fixes often, uh, whereas uh, Clang analyzer, a static analyzer, probably won't give you that, but it will do more complex interprocedural analysis. But there is very much overlap, and when you're designing a new analysis, you might put it within Clang Tidy or Clang Analyzer, depending on where the best fit is. The reason that it's okay for a static analyzer like Coverity to throw lots of false positives is because as long as you're early on your development cycle, false positives don't matter that much. Static checks with a high false positive rate are innocuous as long as you can avoid triggering that error by rewriting your code from then onwards to make it so that your tools don't throw lots of bugs. Uh, nevertheless, they can be a pain if you're trying to refactor old code where they might throw a lot of errors where nothing bad exists. Um, in that case, you just resort to code suggestion like clan tidy uh, and or just allow list all of your old code and only start checking new code for bugs using these static analysis tools. There's also the issue that these sorts of complex inter-procedural analyses can be very expensive on large code bases because they just don't scale that well. So you often have to be careful around the scope. Something else that you can do that is more inspired by the uh, formal methods community are concolic tests at things like CLI, um, where what you do here is you combine regular execution and fuzzing with symbolic evaluation. What that means is that we try and generate test inputs using our fuzzing methodology that covers every single path in a program. So our example on screen here has this um, if statement and this if statement here. So what we've got is a tree of different paths that we could go down. And we want to generate inputs that will cover every single path of these. And so we have our two choices here. X equals zero, Y equals zero gives us the case where X is not equal to 100,000. Then down this path, we've got another if statement. And so we'll want to generate one test, one test that uh, doesn't match this and one test that does. So this isn't a formal proof of correctness, but it does give you at least good code coverage that you will test every line of code, even if you won't test every possible input. abstract interpretation, which is things like a strictness analysis or range domain analysis. Uh, tools here include a frame C and infer. And um, what you do here is that rather than running on the real code, you try and create a static analysis that abstracts away the exact domain of the output and tries to limit it. So rather than looking at every possible input to these codes, we might look at the extreme ranges and try and use that to learn something about what the code is doing. In the example on screen, what we have is that we have our array A here, which we've marked besides 4,000 times size of int. So 
A's value at indexes are between 0 and 4,000. What we have here is x equals 0, x is less than 10,000 x plus plus, so we know that x can be between 0 and 9,999. What we'll then know is therefore that given that y is x plus x, if we just uh, times 2 on both of the extremes, we know that y can be between 0 and 19,998. Now that's an over approximation. Uh, abstract interpretations often over approximate to make them uh, be guaranteed to terminate so that they don't have to solve the halting problem. Um, but what we get out of here is that uh, we say that, oh, it could possibly be true that y has a value of a one or three or five or any other odd number, even though we know that technically isn't true, just to simplify down the analysis. Likewise, here we know that z could be between 0 and 8191. And so, when we then run a of z, we know that this z could have a value as high as 8191, and so there's potentially a bug here. As long as we haven't over-approximated too much, we know that there's a potential for this a of z to be above the 4000, which is the limits of its bounds. Another abstract domain we might work over is this simple one, which just says whether a number is odd or even, um, where for our x equals 0, x is less than 10,000 x plus plus, we know that x can be odd or even, so its domain includes both. Whereas y equals x plus x, we know can only ever be even. Uh, whether its input is odd or even, the output will be even, so we can reduce the domain of y to just even. So that means that this quite clearly fake code here, um, which is uh, a of either 10,000 or 0, depending on whether y and 1 is uh, 0 or 1, is therefore safe because that input to there will only ever be even and so that means that y and 1 will never give a value other than 0 and so we'll never access the invalid 10,000 element of a. So we can make these judgments about code without understanding the code, without violating any sort of halting problem and without having exhaustive testing. But of course, where this gets messy is if we go back to our original abstract domain, which just talks about the ranges here, rather than every single possible value that could go into that thing. Um, our over approximation here, which says that, oh, actually, y can be anything between 0 and 19998, means that we think there could be odd numbers out of here, even though there can't be. And so our analysis thinks that this could potentially be out of bounds, even though actually we know it couldn't. But you need to make these sorts of over approximations to make these computations either tractable or decidable. And that's why you get this sorts of over approximation where you might claim there is a bug, even though there isn't, in an abstract interpretation framework. So nothing we've really looked at is either sound or complete uh, necessarily, in that the static analyzers will often be designed to throw errors where none exist and not find all errors. And the abstract interpreters may often be designed to be unsound and throw lots of potential errors when there are none or incomplete, because having both might cause you an issue of undecidability, where your analysis never terminates. Formal methods are something that try and prove properties about programs, and they try and get something correct by construction. So we've got an example on screen of a sort of formal method that you can use to prove something over a program, where the way this should be read is that um, the thing on the left is a precondition, the thing on the right is a postcondition. And we can prove that assuming that p, if we want b then s then else t and if, then q should be true. If whenever b is true, if b and p can be assumed at the start and q can be inferred when running s, um, and the opposite when not b is true, uh, assuming p, and we can infer q, then if q is true at the end of both cases, we can infer it's true over a program of this structure. Now. These sorts of formal tools that try and prove things correct by construction are quite widely used in hardware, where you can construct really good models of the hardware itself, things like temporal logic and model checking. They aren't used so much in software, 
because they scale really badly, which is why you end up going for tools that don't give guaranteed correctness. Things like concolic tests that don't give you proof about every possible input, but do try and at least check every possible path. And things like covarity that make no guarantees of correctness and yet tend to find lots of real bugs in the real world. Type systems should be familiar to many of you who've written anything in something like Java or C or C++ or OCaml or Haskell, where the language has types over the code and it will throw a bug if you try and violate those and it will check them all at compile time. Unlike something like the PHP on screen where this is totally valid in lots of languages that something that is a string can become an integer all of a sudden and that's fine and there might be lots of implicit casts and that's often great for quick and dirty productivity it means that you don't have to spend time dealing with lots of errors in programs that are probably completely fine but nevertheless we've seen that languages that do have dynamic typing often get more static typing features where you get the compile time system complaining at you for doing something weird with your types added over the top of them. So with PHP, um, there was hack which was developed to add types over the top to check if you do anything that looks probably a bit bad at compile time with respect to casting things to different types. Um, and that also ended up being adopted in PHP 7 uh, with static typing. And you'll try and infer types for productivity in many of these tools. You won't force the programmer to type down this is an integer, this is a string, when you can learn that automatically. Um, in SQL, there are tricks you can do with type systems to make it so that anything you execute in your SQL is either static text or refuses to compile uh, statically typed languages like C, C++, Java, or Camel Haskell already have type systems that will throw up warning slash errors in usual compilation. Uh, the trend is to move towards languages with stricter type systems or put strong typing over dynamic languages such as JavaScript or use tools that move more of the programming interface into static checks because of this issue of technical debt. It may be quicker to write programs with dynamic typing, but you end up with more issues later on when you have code that just does all sorts of crazy stuff that is untestable. Right, so on the SQL example, um, you may have seen this incredibly famous XKCD comic about this idea of it being really easy to write a web application that does stuff with user data that can cause SQL injection attacks by having it so that you can escape out of the what is normally supposed to be data input and start executing real queries and clearly this is bad and it's still one of the number one attack methods on the internet today and this comic tells you to avoid that by just sanitizing your database inputs uh, making sure that you don't have any escape characters in there actually these days that isn't usually considered sufficient uh, the advice in that comic is not enough uh, these days, what you will do is you won't just sanitize your inputs. You will use something like a safe SQL to make the input command totally separate from the potentially attacker controlled data input. The way that you'll do that is with what we call prepared statements. Uh, your query code will be either in the static text of the application or your program will refuse to compile. Um, you can do that in all sorts of ways, and there's various tools to help you do this. Um, one way includes trying to sort of hack over the C++ templated code uh, system where you can use templates to write code to ensure that all command input to your SQL database was there at compile time so that no injection can occur. The malicious, potentially malicious input can't ever be executed as code. And that is both easier to pull off in practice than sanitization, i.e. it covers more things in a more complete way where perhaps sanitization is enough, but it's very difficult to get complete coverage over all of the things that you need to sanitize away. Right, so those are the tools, but clearly getting real software working in the real world is not just about the tools that you need to use. In the real world, inevitably things will go wrong and bugs will end up in your deployed code. 
whether that's from code that you've written or other code that you've included in libraries that suddenly turns out there's a bug in. The problem that you will have is not that you'll expect your code to work all the time, but that you'll want people who discover bugs in your code to report it to you before they disclose it publicly. Or indeed, you'll want to avoid them selling the bugs in your code to someone else who might then use it to attack your users. Likewise, you want to avoid letting your CEO, when it turns out that there's some horrible bug in your code that's made all of your users vulnerable, you want to avoid them trying to deny slash deflect the issue by blaming someone else or uh, trying to sue the messenger. And if you want to make sure that your programming deployment will really work and won't just uh, make all of your users totally vulnerable. A lot of this still isn't really agreed upon, right? Uh, there is this uh, conflict between responsible disclosure where you tell all the companies the bugs that you found in their code um, and then they might say, oh no, we aren't going to fix that and if you reveal it, we'll sue you. Uh, or full disclosure where you tell everyone immediately and give the vendor no window of disclosure for them to fix it. It's not entirely clear which ones of these is the better way to ensure the security of software, right? Um, in that full disclosure gives that window of vulnerability, but it means that the vendor is incentivized to fix it. Responsible disclosure removes some of that window, but can give the vendor an opportunity to not fix it. Um, the convergence of this has been around uh, 90 day deadlines for disclosure. If you're Google, we've talked about this before, what you do is you give a 90 day window where if the vendor hasn't fixed it within those 90 days, you disclose anyway. Um, the principle behind this is that their focus is on protecting end users. They do what they think is best for end users and that includes disclosing anyway after 90 days to stop the vendors from just never fixing the bug. You'll need good examples of good and bad disclosures to motivate the company you work for. So you'll need examples of other companies that have done the right thing and that have done the wrong thing. Otherwise, your CEO will be motivated to deny and deflect. You'll need to get your PR right. You'll need to be honest when you get breaches, which will be inevitable in code bases of any serious size. Uh, it's the law in the EU and the US that whenever you've got customer's data that may have been breached, you need to disclose it properly. You'll need to remind your CEO of these responsibilities and you'll need to acknowledge that there will be a PR and stock hit to these big vulnerabilities and you'll have to be able to handle that and try and mitigate any damage. Um, but since CEOs have been fired after large breaches, these really are a CEO issue and you'll need your CEO to understand this in order to get real products that really work. We've talked about disclosure twice before, first in the first lecture and then in the lecture on ecosystems and finding bugs in applications is often too difficult for you to internalize all of that within your own company. You'll want to build an ecosystem. You'll want to incentivize external researchers to do the right thing as far as you, a company, are concerned in reporting the bugs to you rather than selling them on to nation state actors or on vulnerability markets. So you'll want to offer bug bounties and you'll want to price those using vulnerability pricing. If you look at what a Google Microsoft and Apple do around their operating systems, uh, the vulnerability price uh, ratchets up over time so that they at least match what everyone else is offering. Uh, and it's based on the severity of the bug. A remote code exploit with zero clicks is about a million dollars of bug bounty on all three of those platforms. But for that to really work, you'll need a good reputation you can't end up with a reputation for not paying out, which is the natural thing to do, right? It's to deny and deflect. If you do, then people won't report to you anymore. They'll sell it instead to someone else. Within your company, you'll perhaps want red and blue teams. Uh, blue teams 
defend and detect. Red teams attack. They attack your own company. And it's the blue team's job to try and find those attacks. And the, you sort of gamify this by making it a competition between the two teams so that the red team is adequately motivated to really put up a serious attack on your systems rather than just be motivated into burying their heads in the sand and saying everything's fine and dandy. Chaos engineering, which we've talked about once already, uh, an example being Netflix's Simeon Army, is where you just knock out systems at random so that you can deal with adversaries doing exactly the same. Um, and you can extend this to chaos security engineering by adding in random attacks too. Uh, a lot of sustainability in code is about making the extreme commonplace so that the attacker deliberately causing these extremes won't cause you that much havoc when it happens because you're used to it. Um, that means things like uh, patching using your regular mechanism for patching when there's been a breach so that you don't use extreme code only in extreme circumstances where it will be liable to break when you need it the most. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have incidents, you're going to have to deal with them, so you'll need to think about security incident and event management for when this happens. So the way that it's worth thinking about this is with a pipeline like this, right? So you monitor all the time, you will buy threat intelligence from specialized firms, you will run honeypots to capture unique attacks against your systems and monitor those attacks. Uh, you'll listen to consumers and get them to report to you with incentives to get them to report to you rather than anyone else and to get them to engage with you rather than just ignore the problem. There have been lots of examples of attacks over the years where they've been discovered independently several times before anyone reported it to the vendor and got it fixed simply because the vendor wasn't listening. You give bounties to researchers so that they report to you rather than anyone else. Uh, you engage with vulnerability markets, uh, certs and CVEs, so that you can read the attacks that are happening to everyone else and get them fixed if they apply to your code too, given how connected all code is when most systems will be using lots of external libraries. When you find out there's been an attack or a vulnerability, you need to go into repair mode. So you want an orchestrated response that doesn't involve just fixing the bug. It also involves PR for vulnerability reports to major breaches to keep everyone updated and to keep the company honest. Um, you'll want intrusion detection systems and monitoring to observe whether attacks are actually happening. Uh, you'll want to identify the responsible dev teams who need to start designing patches to fix the vulnerability. You'll need to notify your suppliers and your customers to Mention that there's been a breach, mention what may have been affected, and keep them up to date on when it will be fixed and how vulnerable they'll be in the meantime. You'll need to have an emergency response policy. You'll need to make sure that you can contact your responder teams even if the rest of your system is attacked. In 2021, we saw the big Facebook outage where there were stories in the press of people in Facebook not being able to access their buildings because their building access system used the same BGP system that caused the outage of all of their servers. And so that just made everything that much harder to fix. Once your patches are ready, you'll need to distribute them. The way you do that is you use the same system that you use for everything else because otherwise it's not going to work. You want to use automated patching for everything so you can respond quickly to zero days. And you want to use it for things that aren't zero days too. You should just run your normal patch process as quickly as possible rather than using a different one that will be untested and therefore prone to breaking. Reassurance. You'll need to get your CEO and board directors to be honest and quick, to keep confidence of your customers and to limit their damage both to your company and externally. Um, again, you'll need examples of firms that do well and do badly. You'll need to be able to contact everyone necessary at high speed. You'll need a plan to deal with the press. Uh, Intel fared more badly on Spectre and Meltdown many, than many other companies that were affected because their PR just wasn't ready. So you'll need press release templates of varying severity for the security incident that will inevitably happen to avoid stonewalling multiple journalists who keep asking you for comment and you just don't have one ready.
So that brings us more specifically onto this issue of the patch cycle, of how you get code out there once you've found a vulnerability. And we've got two quotes here from the Google book that's quoted in the course resource list. Uh, the first one we've seen before in the first lecture, before you tackle a same day, zero day vulnerability response, make sure you're patched for the top hits to cover critical vulnerabilities from recent years. Don't just focus on the shiny and new, make sure that your systems work and are patched against all of the vulnerabilities that have been released over the past decade. And make sure you can get that configuration locked down tight for every system that you can potentially be vulnerable on. The second quote is, if you're privy to information about a vulnerability under embargo, and rolling out a patch would break the embargo, you must wait for a public announcement before you can patch along with the rest of the industry. If you're involved in incident response prior to the announcement of a vulnerability, work with other parties to agree on an announcement date that suits the rollout process of most organizations, for example, a Monday. So again, we've talked about this a little bit before, but what this means is that you can't just patch things uh, at will if they're going to make everyone else vulnerable. What you need to do is you need to coordinate your response with all of the other companies that are affected. So the example I gave in the first lecture of the buffer overflow attack in OpenSSL Heartbleed, Google did actually patch some of their most critical systems on the sly, but that's very risky because you can reveal the existence of the bug to other parties who can then attack other people who aren't as fast as you. So what you do is you get all of your tools ready for the announcement of the zero day, and then you patch and scan. You patch everything you possibly can within that time, and you also, in the meantime, develop tools to find the stragglers. Things that can't be immediately patched and might cause you more havoc, you can find them and isolate them and fix them when possible. Again, when you've got zero days, you use the exact same tools as you use the rest of the time. You just have expedited rollout. You just do it faster. Again, you need to have your PR ready and you need to have a plan of how you're going to deal with this, not only so that you can fix the bug, but so that you can reassure everyone else. This is not just about your own assurance. It's about regulators and insurers and customers too. And you need to track outlier machines that can't be locked down you to a known patchable config. Uh, again, this is sort of an example of this uh, perimeter versus deperimeterization thing we talked about in the network security lecture, where you need both because deperimeterization is great when you can lock everything down, but when you can't, you'll still need perimeter defenses to stop the vulnerable machines that you can't lock down from being attacked. In Google's book, they talk about the example of Heartbleed and they give the advice that you plan for the worst case. You prepare for rapid deployment of patches at scale in a safe way using continuous integration. You regularly rotate keys so that even if things have become vulnerable, they'll only be vulnerable for a limited window of time. And you'll have a good communication channel to developers and users to manage the process and manage the fallout. Now, patching in this automated way does actually conflict with a lot of standards and certification based safety mechanisms. Uh, it gets tricky with things like automotive, especially with the sorts of sustained velocity you need for 10 years of patches, right? If your thing was certified safe on a particular code base and you've changed that code base for a security reason, is it still guaranteed to be safe in the same way? It's an open question, isn't it? Especially when you want to have a monthly patches for your car because it's connected to the internet uh, to keep it secure for the next 10 years or 10 years after the last one has rolled off the conveyor belt which from a pure sustainability point of view from an environmental sustainability point of view uh, the eu has cottoned on to and is not allowing the car manufacturers to only give you patches for a couple of years like they do with phones and how do you manage risks to your systems well Insiders are typically the biggest risk, uh, whether that's because they're straight up evil or simply because they're careless. Um, a good system 
should be invulnerable to careless users. You shouldn't be able to accidentally mistype something and cause a worldwide BGP outage. Your system should be designed so that there are proxies in the way of doing that. Um, so that your developers who go wrong either through innocence or malice won't cause a complete system failure. You'll need to embed control in the culture unless you employ sociopaths. You'll need to know what real people will do in real situations and optimize around that. Um, so bank managers know that dual control safe locks where you'll need multiple people to actually allow you into a safe, uh, reduce risk to their families being taken hostage and dual signature spreads burden when things go wrong so that that's in their best interest to have other people take a look at something before it gets approved. Code audits are insisted on by the major tech companies. Um, semiconductor manufacturers insist on rules around tailgating into buildings uh, because uh, loose slip sync chips. Uh, so you don't want to allow any spy to get in simply because it's uncomfortable to prevent someone from following you into a building because it's impolite. In a bank, you'll expect 1% of your staff to go bad each year. That's just how things work at scale. So you need policies that can handle this. Uh, even though it's psychologically very taxing to think of your staff going bad, accountability matters. Whose neck will be on the line when things go bad? If the answer is nobody, then things will go wrong. One way that companies try and mitigate these risks, which is more about compliance than assurance, is auditing and shopping for compliance in auditing, where when you're getting an audit, you want to prove you're compliant and that you're totally safe and that customers should buy your product, then the natural incentive is to go for a soft hand auditor um, who won't notice any problems and will just make everything go away, right? You won't get any real security out of this, but hey, you'll please a regulator. And then there's a quote from the course textbook. Uh, one hedge fund manager who made a hundred million from shorting Wirecard, uh, Jim Chanos, said, when people ask us who were the auditors, I always say, who cares? Almost every fraud has been audited by a major accounting firm. Um, so getting the big accounting firms to audit something might convince a regulator, but it might not give you actually that good security. You will need to have motivated attackers who are motivated to find bugs rather than hide their existence if you really want secure systems. And the standards in this area, which we'll look at more on in our lecture on regulation, are ISO 27001, uh, where you analyze the risk systematically and subject the unacceptable ones to some form of risk treatment uh, and you handle that in a standards compliant way and get yourself your seal of approval, um, a failure. Uh, almost every major company hit by a big breach had this standard because it's a lovely tick box and it didn't stop it at all. Um, same on the common criteria, which are more specific, but fail in the same way of you shop for whichever auditor will give you the easiest uh, path to clearance. Um, there's this idea of the principle of maximum complacency, where owners will seek endorsement from a single certifier and resist attempts to get them to actually improve any product that they certify. Because that's the cheapest thing to do, right? Even though it gives no real guarantees of any safety to their end users, but hey, who cares about them? If we can just dump all of the costs of security onto the end users, that's great for us, right? You can't let tick boxes, even though they're psychologically thrilling and feel safe, get in the way of real critical thought. You can't let them get in the way of tackling the actual hard problems most enshrined in the Agile development framework, but really important everywhere that you handle the hardest problems first and make them go away if you want something to really work. And you can't use that to ignore incidents and complaints on the ground if you want something to really work. Part of the issue is that being a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer, is kind of a thankless job uh, because if you want to rise up the ranks in a company and get to CEO, that involves not offending anyone. And the job of a CISO is to offend people, right? It's to tell people no. Um, 
the average tenure of a CISO is only two years, so you don't get that institutional experience. Uh, you need a tech background to make the right decisions, but you need people skills to handle saying no to people while avoiding offending anybody. And if the CEO doesn't value security, the CISO has no chance. Uh, but luckily, laws and regulation are being made and are increasing in value that do align the incentives of the CEO towards avoiding data breaches because CEOs are finally starting to get fined for this and getting real fines that really matter. Blame matters and accountability. Nobody can be held accountable once a product is delivered. Expect trouble. London Ambulance Service disaster being a prime example. Uh, but don't shoot the messenger and have both specialist and generalist handle security. You can't just have one person whose job is security, you need those experts, but you also need security embedded completely in your coding culture. Prime example of this is, at least on the correctness point of view, is Microsoft, who won out over IBM in the OS market because they had better aligned code incentives. Uh, in Microsoft, if you had a bug in your code that you wrote, it was your job to fix it. In IBM, those teams were totally separate. So the incentives were for the code writers to write junky code and pass it on to people, whereas the incentives in Microsoft were that you wrote correct code the first time. So productivity was just a lot higher. Finally, you won't know where the next disaster will come from, so you'll need to be adapted. You can't rely on guarantees from five years ago to make you secure today. We just don't know where the next big disaster will come from. And there's been hundreds of examples of novel attacks over the past few decades that just totally changed the landscape. You'll need to be able to deal with those and you'll need your product to be able to evolve with them.